David here with Fig Boot on Pens, uh, back with another Q&A. Uh, I'm trying to get to these a little more often than I have in the past. Uh, maybe not every month, maybe more like every other month or so, but more often than in the past. Uh, I do have a ton of content for this video, so let's get right into it. Uh, to begin with, uh, something I wanted to talk about is that I have started a Patreon page. Um, if you are not familiar with Patreon, it is a site in which you can directly support the content creators that you enjoy. Uh, by no means is this channel a, a money-making venture. Uh, the, uh, the revenue generated from YouTube is nice, but it is minimal. Um, I've been considering creating a page for a while, and I've had it built out for a while, but I, I finally decided to make it live. Uh, Every dollar raised through Patreon would basically be used to directly fund this channel. Um, for example, there might be a, a new uh, entry level or, or mid-range pen that comes out into the market that I, I feel the community would really like to see more about, but it might not necessarily fit in with my personal tastes. Um, there are times that I work with retailers to donate pens, but if not, uh, the funds would help offset the purchase of that pen for review. Uh, in addition, it could help upgrade my equipment. Uh, the camera I use is okay, but it is rather ancient. Uh, it could definitely use an upgrade. Uh, again, any donations are, are just being put right back into the channel. We'll see how this goes, but there's a, a possibility of having special exclusive content for supporters and other rewards as well. Um, I greatly appreciate you watching my channel, and if you, you should choose to support it through Patreon, I greatly appreciate that as well. Um, you can find a link to the site below in the notes. Okay, next topic. Uh, this past weekend was the Triangle Pen Show, which is held in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, just for information's sake, the Triangle name is a reference to the Research Triangle, which is uh, kind of the area anchored by three main research universities, which are uh, North Carolina State, uh, the Duke University, and the uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, as well as the cities of Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. Uh, the show is only about a half hour from my house, so it's basically my home show. Uh, the Triangle Show is a, a medium-sized show that really kind of skews more toward vintage than modern. Uh, the show was at a new hotel this year, but from everything that I could tell, it ran very smooth. Uh, the organizer, Terry, who also runs the Columbus Show, I, I think he does a really great job. Uh, Lisa Van Ness and her husband were there, as well as their wall of inks. Uh, as well as the Andersons, uh, Brian and Lisa were there. It's always great to see them. Uh, I do hear that their, uh, their Chicago new retail uh, store in Chicago is doing outstanding. So uh, we're really pleased to hear that. Uh, Brad Dowdy from Knock was there as well. Uh, he brought along his kids who had uh, lots of fun playing and uh, hanging around at various booths throughout the weekend. Uh, it's the home show of Franklin Kristoff as well. So their folks were grateful to uh, not have to fly to a show for a change. Uh, Nick Pang was there giving a couple of calligraphy seminars, uh, and there were some other informational seminars as well. Uh, Brian Krusak had a couple of really new, uh, cool new offerings. Uh, first of all, he had a limited edition Star Wars themed pen. Uh, it has all the planets inlaid with uh, different stones, and, and then a cityscape of a planet. Uh, I, you know, I can't, it kind of slips my mind which planet it is, but it was a specific one in the Star Wars universe. Uh, Ryan also started making some pens with wood clips. Well, the, the clip itself is metal, but it's overlaid with wood. Uh, I think they look pretty nice. I think they fit in well with the theme of his pens. Uh, speaking of looking nice, he had a couple of all antler pens that really looked sharp. Um, it's an interesting material. You can really see the veins and the patterns in the, uh, in the material. It really gives it a sense of life. It took a lot of self-control, uh, but I resisted the temptation to pick one of those up. I, I went over to his, uh, his uh, booth a couple of times, his table a couple of times, and, and had them in my hand, and it took everything I could to, to, uh, to maintain that self-control. Uh, the Pay It Forward table was there in full force, giving out pens and supplies and even cookies to anyone in need. Uh, Crystal Azer, the woman behind Hippo Noto, made the long trip from Hawaii. Uh, she had a couple of new prototypes with her. The one on the left is a standard Hippo Noto, but the two on the right are prototypes of a B6 notebook she plans to call the Pygmy Hippo. 
Uh, she might also be coming out with a notepad she's planning to call the Hippopotamus. Uh, that name just made me laugh. Uh, Jonathan Brooks and his wife Shay and their daughter were in attendance. Uh, Jonathan had some great acrylic pens and some really cool new Arushi creations. Uh, Jonathan sat down with me for an interview where we mainly talked about his Arushi work. Uh, it was a real fun conversation, so look, to that, look for that to come out uh, in the very near future. Uh, at uh, every year at the show, there's even an auction, which was really well attended and very lively as well. Um, you never know what you might just find at a show. Uh, something I thought was interesting was this ring I came across. It was a sales reward for general managers of the Parker Pen Company. Uh, the general manager would receive this large ring, and they would also receive another smaller ring for their wives. So uh, I just thought that was kind of a sign of the times. Uh, g times and uh, gender roles have changed events since then. Uh, oh, uh, Andy Lambro was at the show as well. Uh, here's a rod of uh, his diffusion bonded acrylic he uses for some of his classic pens models. Uh, it's kind of cool to see the raw materials used to create the pens you love. And Handy has some things coming out in the near future that are gonna be very, very cool as well. Uh, in regard to loot, I actually didn't purchase a single pen or ink. Uh, I, uh, I, the only thing I did was I purchased a little folding wallet that had the Parker logo on the front. Uh, we're heading out uh, of town on a rather large overseas trip here soon and I was doing my best to behave and not put a, a dent in my wallet. Uh, but just because I didn't purchase anything didn't mean that I didn't walk out of the show empty handed. Uh, I ended up with a few things from vendors which will be featured in, uh, and given away in future reviews. Um, let's see here. Uh, Van Ness provided this uh, nice paper blanks notebook as well as a Wingsung 698. They also provided a bottle of uh, Califolio uh, Antronopal as well as a bottle of Krishna uh, Valakari or Vaikari? V A I K A R E. Vaikari. I guess that's how you pronounce that. Uh, I also have a bottle of Krishna Hippo ink, which is something exclusive for, uh, for Crystal Laser and her Hippo Noto. Uh, let's see. And then uh, also courtesy of Federalist Pens, I have a brand new pen from Le Bon called the Solar. Um, it's a metal pen that I thought looked a lot like the, the Namasu Orion a bit. Um, I haven't inked it up yet to play with it, but um, I really like the looks of it. It feels very solid. Uh, there's also a couple other things that were provided as well that I can't quite share yet, but you will see them down the line. All in all, it was a great show. Um, it's a rather low-key show, and it's always fun to hang out with friends, as well as make new ones. Uh, we have a really great community. Uh, just uh, as an example of how great it is, I had a friend who uh, actually lost a custom Jonathan Brooks pen that he had made uh, for her. It, it fell out of a backpack and onto the ground, uh, and they had no idea it was missing. Uh, someone from Franklin Kristoff found it on the ground, and then they gave it to the show organizer who recognized it as uh, Jonathan Brooks' work, and he came over to Jonathan's table while actually I was sitting there next to him talking to him and uh, Jonathan and I instantly knew the who the owner of the pen was so uh, I took it and made sure that it got back into her possession but it's an example of how our community is filled with great folks who are always looking out for one another uh, I'm really looking forward to the DC show in just about two months so I can hang out with folks again. Uh, if you've never been to a show, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, even the small and medium-sized shows are worth attending. Okay, on to the next section of this Q&A video, the actual Q&A. So, um, let's see. Matt Moser asks... Um, is there any difference between the experience of reviewing pens from your own collection and the experience of ruing, ru uh, reviewing pens that have been loaned to you? I, you know, I try for there not to be. Um, I want to do my best to provide an objective review no matter what the source of the pen is. Uh, just because it's something in my collection doesn't mean it's perfect. Um, I've made poor buying decisions just like everyone else. And just because... Um, 
a company provides me or loans me a pen, then that does not guarantee that I'm only going to have positive things to say about that. Uh, you know, I've seen people comment in forums that they feel that reviewers uh, feel pressured to give positive reviews to pen companies to, that provide them things at no cost, because if they don't, then they'll stop receiving things from that company. Uh, for me, I really don't feel that that's the case at all. Uh, I'm going to give you my opinion regardless of how others might feel about it. Now, I will say that I do consciously try to stay very positive and upbeat in my reviews. So if I have something negative to say, a pen, say about a pen, I typically do so in a, with a kind of a positive uh, skew to it, if that makes sense. Uh, let's see. The next question is uh, from Dr. Fountain Pens, and they ask, since you rotate your pens daily, how do you manage the guilt of having expensive pens, which may be used for le uh, used less disproportionately or disproportionately, excuse me, to their cost? Um, I struggle with this issue. On, on one hand, it's nice to have a large collection. Think of it like a library. A, a book might sit on the shelf for years, but there's some comfort to know that it's there uh, if you should ever need it. And the same goes for pens. There are some pens that aren't in my regular loca rotation that I basically keep for reference. You know, I, I've really thought about culling the herd, so to speak, uh, rather than having over 200 pens, most of which receive kind of medium to little use, maybe having 50 pens that you just love and get, more, and get to use more often. Uh, that might be the way to go. I don't know. Um, I, I haven't really made up my mind yet. Uh, I was actually taking a look at my, uh, my everyday carry tracker the other day, the spreadsheet that I keep, and I saw that over the last year I had used one of my favorite pens only three times, uh, which I, you know, I thought was a little sad, that that pen really deserved to be used more. So who knows, maybe I will uh, trim things down a bit. I'll let you know if I do. The next question is uh, from Peter Kaza, and he asks, how do you do your ink swabs? Uh, and what is your favorite black ink? Um, I tell you what, in order to do that and to show you how I do my ink swabs, let's go over here to camera two. Okay, there was two questions. One question was about my favorite black inks. I actually have two. Uh, one of my first favorite black inks I ever had was this Conway Stewart Bodeman. Uh, I'm not even sure if it's available anymore. I, I don't believe so, but this was one of the first black inks that I, I had, and I always thought it was very well behaved and, uh, uh, and just a solid black that has uh, some nice density to it. Uh, but then as far as one that is available to pick up that I know is available to pick up is this uh, this Sailor Gentle Black, the Kiwa Guru. Um, this is what the bottle looks like that it comes in. Uh, and this is a well-known well black uh, that is one of the more pop popular ones out there. And I agree that it's a solid black and I enjoy it as well. Okay, the other question was about my ink samples and how I keep my, uh, how I do my swabs. Um, first of all, I use these uh, Nemocene word cards. Uh, now, the thing is that these Nemocene word cards are no longer uh, carried and that uh, you could basically replace them with the, uh, the coloring notebooks. And you know what? Let me actually get one of those. I didn't get one out. Here we go. This is the uh, the coloring test, uh, ink testing book, uh, and this essentially is the same thing, uh, except for the the quality of the paper is a little bit better on this coloring than it is on these uh, Nemocene uh, word cards. But uh, when I found out that these were going to be discontinued. I actually pretty much bought a lifetime supply of these. So I have four or five. So uh, eventually I might either sell those and move over to the color rings uh, and support Anna and her venture, uh, or uh, I might stick with the word cards. We'll see, I don't know, but I have a number of these. But it makes it real easy to then kind of flip through and see your different inks. And you can see here, this is all of my blues and I have plenty of blues in here about, boy, almost all of this. That's like all blues. Uh, but when it comes to actually creating them, uh, that what I do, and here, here's an example of one I just recently did. This is the Krishna Hippo ink, uh, which is the, uh, the exclusive ink that Krishna made for Crystal Laser and the uh, Hippo Noto. So 
How did I make this? I used two different things. Um, one, you start off with a blank card. And let's see, I have a couple of ink samples here that I needed to actually do. Uh, one is a Krishna ink, and this one is called Vicari. Uh, and we'll just open this up here. And I actually use two different things. One is I use this glass pen, uh, just because it's uh, consistent and I can kind of dip it and clean it real easily. And uh, it, it's not like I have to clean an entire pen. So what I do is I go ahead and I dip that and when you see that it kind of stays right there on the nib and this is the Krishna and this is the Vicari. And I already misspelled it so uh, let's see. I was looking at it and I misspelled it. So uh, that is backwards. Uh, so once I have done that, then I get a Q-tip and I dip it in there a little bit and I let it soak up and then I kind of rent, uh, just get a little bit of it off so it's not overly saturated. And once I've done that, then I go ahead and make the swab. Uh, and then I go ahead and let that dry. Now, I do have another bottle here, which is the Califolio, Califolio Antronopal. So let's go ahead and do that, and let's see if I can actually spell the name of this ink correctly. Oh, actually, I need to clean this off. Usually, in order to clean this off, uh, I just use a, uh, a tissue. A tissue then I might just wet it just a little bit and then it comes right off. So um, here we have the Califolio and Andronopal. Look at that, I could spell that right then I take my Q-tip and I take the other end if I'm doing multiple samples here. Then I get a little bit of it off just because that ink will really look differently and it might look a lot darker if it's more saturated. So I try to get some of it off and then rub that on there. So there we have our two samples. Uh, and you know, you're just starting to see this a little bit, but when this one dries, it really gets uh, kind of a greenish sheen on there. That's why I did this one first. I'd hope it would dry a little bit more, but um, uh, this one does actually get a, a really nice greenish sheen that, that goes over uh, most of the, uh, the area. So it was a, a really interesting sheening ink. Okay, back to the rest of the Q and A. Okay, next question. Uh, it is from uh, Jason Wells. Uh, and he says, in my office, I need to use black ink. Can you suggest a cool slash unique bottle that I can sit on my desk? Uh, there's two that I would recommend. Uh, and they're both decent black inks. Uh, and in my opinion, come in pretty cool bottles. Um, first of all, now actually I don't have either of these inks, but I know that I have played with them and I know that they're good, but I have the bottles, uh, or at least bottles that are similar. Uh, the first one is Visconti Black. Um, these plastic bottles have a unique shape that I like, and I think they would look pretty cool sitting on a desk. Um, that uh, I was playing a video game a while back. I was playing uh, Bioshock Infinite. And uh, what did I see in the game? But a bottle of ink that looks very much like a Visconti bottle. I just thought that was kind of cool. Um, the second bottle that I would recommend is from Pilot's Orochizuku line, and that is the Takisumi. Now, uh, like I said, I don't currently own any, but uh, I, I have used it and really enjoyed that black ink, and it is quite possibly my favorite ink bottle. Um, this is what the Orochizuku ink bottle looks like. Um, the glass gives it a bit of heft. Um, I really do like the label on it. It looks really classy. Uh, the indent at the bottom of the bottle makes it look really cool and 
it serves a pur purpose, which is nice, letting your nib get a little bit deeper into there. Uh, and I even like the little string that they put on each bottle. And on top of that, the Orochizuku inks are very well behaved. Okay, the next question is, uh, you've mentioned that you're an avid player of video games. Are you particularly fond of any home consoles, recent or from way back when, or do you keep it to PC? Uh, now, I know that I date myself, I will kind of date myself here, but the very first video game console my family owned growing up was a Pong machine, which was pretty much the very first home console. And if I recall, it pretty much only played two games, kind of a like a racquetball and a tennis, and that was it. Uh, then my parents bought us what was called an Odyssey 2, which was kind of a, a lower tier system of the day, but it was something I really enjoyed. Um, it wasn't until I was out on my own that I picked up an NES, uh, and I played that a lot. I, I am proud to say that I defeated Mike Tyson on my own, no cheat codes. Uh, and then after that, I pretty much moved to PC gaming for quite some time. I played a lot of first person shooters and sports games. Uh, to show you how far online gaming has come, I used to play this golf game and there was a group of people around the world who would play in tournaments, but there was no such thing as online multiplayer. So the organizer would actually send you the settings you would play with and then you would play around and save the file and then actually email it to this guy. And then you would compile everyone's score from around the world and a week or so later then you would find out how you did. Uh, I remember winning a couple of tournaments and he would even uh, email you a little dot matrix printed certificate when you won. Uh, I still have a certificate somewhere that he sent me when I got a hole in one. Uh, eventually, I actually went to work for a, a startup computer peripheral company by the name of Razer. Uh, Razer at the time only produced computer mice, but uh, they've actually grown and have a number of different items they produce nowadays. Um, if you're into computer gaming, then I think you're very familiar with the brand. Um, I was one of the first employees of the company, uh, employee number seven. Uh, I managed all of the uh, press relations and customer service aspects of the company as we began manufacturing and producing our very first two models of gaming mice called the Boom Slangs. Boom Slang 1000 and 2000. Uh, we even had like metal business cards. Uh, uh, since this was right around the year 2000, it's virtually imp uh, impossible to find on the internet now, but there used to be lots of interviews and magazine articles out there where I had quotes since I was the company spokesperson. I still have uh, copies of some of the magazines. Uh, we were very involved heavily in the early days of competitive gaming. Um, I would participate in some of the tournaments. Uh, mainly this was uh, based in uh, Quake 3, or the Quake 3 tournaments. Uh, and then uh, long after I lost and a winner was crowned, uh, then uh, like I would be the guy up on the stage handing over that like oversized check to the champion. Um, I actually found a uh, videotape of a local Dallas news piece from around the year 2000. Uh, I'll put the entire segment at the end of this video and you could see me when I was in my uh, very early 30s and laugh at me a little bit. Uh, my time in the uh, computer gaming industry was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. I was able to meet a lot of the prominent figures in gaming in the early 2000s and have lots of stories from that time and fond memories. Uh, later on, I was uh, big into like World of Warcraft and Hearthstone and Diablo 1 and 2 and 3 and the, the GTA series and many other things. Uh, nowadays, I, I do a fair amount of PC gaming, but I also have uh, an Xbox uh, 360 and a, and a One X that I just, uh, uh, that I p picked up recently that I use on occasion. So that's my gaming background. Uh, the next question is uh, what, from Aaron, and that is what's the most catastrophic pen failure you've had? Well, Aaron, if you watch my Visconti Millionaire review, um, I actually recreate my most catastrophic pen failure. So I'll let you watch that. Uh, and if you'd like to relive my agony slash clumsiness slash stupidity, uh, then uh, you could do so with my little recreation that I had there. Okay, I think that's enough Q&A for now. So how about to uh, kind of close things out, we move on to some mail time. Uh, a number of folks had written me letters uh, and that, you know, I like to share some of them with you. Um, and I have made this commitment that if you send me a letter, then I will write you back. And I'm pretty caught up. I only have a couple that I need to get to. You know, in my life, I've never really been one to write a lot of letters. So this has kind of forced me to do so. But I'm really enjoying it. 
and I actually look forward to it. Um, I've started playing around with wax seals as well, so I guess that kind of gives it an extra layer of fun. So, um, to begin with, we had a letter from Nicholas. Um, he used a number of inks, but on this first page is a very shimmery J. Herban Emerald of Shavor, uh, written with a Visconti Homo Sapiens with an architect nib. Uh, I kind of like it when people say what ink they use as well as what pen and, uh, and nib. It's kind of interesting. Um, he is from Australia, and I seem to get a lot of correspondence from Australia and New Zealand, but he included this nice book called Iconic Melbourne, uh, and it has lots of nice pictures and drawings and sights of the city, and uh, some poetry as well to accompany it. So thanks, Nicholas. I appreciate it. Uh, then we have a, another letter here from Australia, and this one is from Anthony. And Anthony picked some uh, very nice Tomoe River paper. And uh, Anthony says here that he recently picked up a Visconti Homo Sapiens for a birthday gift to himself. So I hope you enjoy your new pen, Anthony. And the, uh, the Homo Sapiens are great. Let's see here. Oh, also, I received a letter a while back from Barbara in, uh, in New Zealand. Uh, Barbara, uh, that I uh, sent a reply back to you, but it bounced, and so I sent it back to you again. So hopefully it will actually get to you, but uh, uh, I had to resend that because it bounced. Um, let's see here. I received a very nice letter from Jim in Spring, Texas, and he wrote this pen, or this... Uh, letter with his uh, Pen BBS Model 323. Uh, I know that a lot of folks have been fond of their Pen BBS acquisitions lately. Uh, I don't own any. Uh, I know they're rather inexpensive. I might need to pick up a couple to review in the future, but we'll see. Let's see here. Then we have a, another, I got received another letter from Brian, who's in Chester, New Jersey. Um, Brian has opened up a little pen shop in Chester in uh, the corner of a friend's boutique right on Main Street. Uh, if you're in the area, it's probably worth checking out. Uh, he, uh, let's see, he included his uh, business card for his little pop-up shop, uh, as well as a Baron Fig sticker. Um, I like uh, stickers and magnets, so if you send me any, there's a strong probability that they'll end up here over my shoulder, uh, over my desk. Okay, next we have a letter from Brian in Ashburn, Virginia. Uh, Brian is otherwise known as Chewbacca, uh, if you hang out on the uh, pen attic slack at all. I like the envelope he used, having uh, kind of the address on some torn paper. It looks kind of cool. Uh, that he wrote the letter uh, using Colorverse Photon, and he also included original poem, which says, let's see, there once was a fellow named Figboot. His pen collection was beyond repute. No matter how you call it, if you value your wallet, it would be best to not follow suit. True. True. Though I will say that I did, like I said, mentioned earlier, I went an entire pen show without purchasing a pen. So I'm trying to do better and show a little bit, a little bit of restraint. Um, next up, we had a letter from uh, Andy, and that Andy's in Traverse City, Michigan, and Andy works for a company that provides insurance to collectible cars and boats. He actually included a couple of stickers. I know they're kind of hard to see, but it says sniff, but don't scratch. They're kind of in reverse. I don't know if you can really even see that, uh, but uh, it's in reference to their insurance business. So uh, thank you very much, Andy. Now, okay, I also received a couple letters from Tony in Kansas City over the last few months. Uh, just check out the lettering on these uh, envelopes. I mean, who wouldn't want to see that show up in their mailbox? That's just kind of cool. And, and I really love that lettering as well. You know, one thing I'd like is it's not perfect. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that some calligraphy looks like it's almost too perfect, like it's done by a machine. But you could tell that, that Tony's is done by hand and it has a lot of character. I, I really enjoy it. Let's see here. Then we had uh, 
a letter from David in Ontario. Uh, and uh, I don't know what paper this is, but I really like it. Uh, David's last name is B, and on the bottom of his uh, of his letter here, that he uh, has a little drawing of a little B next to Mac the dog. Uh, that uh, David actually says that he visited North Carolina with his BMW club. Uh, that uh, David, you should probably check out the uh, Mont Blanc BMW ink. It's very nice. Oh, and he also included a, uh, a little picture here of a polar bear club, or cub, and uh, a polar bear and its cub from a little calendar. Uh, let's see here. Then we have a nice letter from Michael. I like Michael's handwriting. Uh, Michael has a blog called Stylographica where he does some pen and ink and notebook reviews. Um, if you like your reviews in blog form, then you might want to check out his work. Let's see. Then we had a nice letter from from Christine. Uh, then she's in Yorkville, Illinois. So thank you very much, Christine. Let's see, maybe a couple of more. Um, I have a letter from uh, Woody in Spokane and some nice Tomoe River paper. Um, and that Woody says that he's been sharing his fountain pen hobby with his son. And uh, he said something here that was really nice. He says that his family has a principle to make things important to the people we love important to us, which I think is a very nice principle to have. And then finally, uh, I received another uh, letter from Crystal. Uh, I'm sorry, Carissa in Ontario, Canada. Uh, Carissa always goes a little crazy with her washi tape and all the shapes and sizes. Um, and I think it looks kind of cool. Um, but then inside, she wrote her letter. She always, she has very interesting handwriting, very neat handwriting. But the Lamy vibrant pink that she used here really pops off the page. And she actually included a little sample of uh, KWZ Confederation Brown, which was an ink made for last year's uh, Toronto pen show. So thank you very much, Carissa. I'll have to play with that. So uh, I think that's enough for now. I have more letters to share, but uh, those will need to wait for the next Q&A. Um, if you'd care to send me a note, then uh, you can find the address in the notes below. And as I mentioned at the top of the video, if you would care to support these videos in my channel, you can do so through Patreon, and there'll be a link in the notes below for that as well. I greatly appreciate your support as well as your comments. So until next time, thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you later. A different breed of athlete will compete for a world championship this weekend right in Dallas. NBC5's Cliff Caldwell takes a look at the upstart league and what unusual games they play. Think of it as the pregame warm-up with the field crews laying down the line. We had over a quarter million dollars worth of equipment leased from uh, Lucent. We had enough, uh, actually enough networking power to run Wall Street. Expect a lot of shots and scoring. But instead of jogging on, these athletes log on. The aim, the best score on a computer game called Quake 3. For some, it's a way of life. Go home, play every day, you know, sometimes skip homework. These guys show off sponsors paying for their week-long trip from Western Europe. I mean, we've never been to an event like this big before. Like, and it's nice, to, I mean, we've never been to any American events, never played with any Americans before, really. How long have you guys waited? Angel Munoz is the brains behind the cyber athlete tournament. He wants the mostly teenage competitors recognized. Just like the big boys from the NFL. They practice. They have to, uh, they put a lot of time into practice. They have to develop skills. They have to have great eye and hand coordination. Folks here say gaming is big business. They tell me $6 billion was spent last year by enthusiasts. And with that much money and devotion, sponsors line up. These are our consumers right here. And these are the people that if we can win these people over, then we can win the, win the rest of the market over as well. The two-year-old league, with its $50,000 in cash and prizes, hopes to do the same.
Cliff Caldwell, NBC5, Dallas. And Cliff tells us that the competition is this weekend at the high